For the past several months, uh, had these lunches, brought people together in recognition that the, the challenges we face uh, demand a wider dialogue uh, and real strategic thinking about the direction the country is facing, the difficulty of working on these issues in this environment, the challenges uh, for progressives with a hostile Congress uh, and a difficult media, and in some ways a disinterested country. And that is, of course, what we're going to hear about today. I want to mention uh, a report that the Brennan Center just published this week uh, that Eric Lane, who's our senior fellow uh, and the co-author with May Barnett, on civic literacy in New York State, which addresses some of these issues. And take a look, uh, if you haven't already, at the op-ed piece in the Daily News today uh, about the results of a public opinion survey, and not just the fact that people don't know who their senator is or what the branches of government are called, but the deeper purpose of our democracy. Um, we're very lucky to hear from Eric Altman in this conversation. Eric is an old friend, a close friend of mine, and of the Brennan Center. Uh, he is one of the country's leading and most prolific public intellectuals. He is a distinguished professor of English at Brooklyn College, a graduate of Cornell, Yale, and received his PhD at Stanford. The author of eight books, uh, including the best-selling What Liberal Media and the book on Bush, uh, as well as books on democracy, including When Presidents Lie, Who Speaks for America, Why We're Liberals, and for Erica Wood, the book uh, Bruce Springsteen, um, uh, Ain't No Sin to Be Glad You're Alive. Um, and he writes for The Nation uh, and is a fellow at CAP. Uh, and uh, his new book, which we will be selling when this is all over, is called Kabuki Democracy. It is based on a Nation magazine article that he wrote that many of you seen uh, that addresses uh, the challenges facing Barack Obama and all of us. So, uh, Eric, uh, we're eager to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, of course, to Janine and uh, all the folks in our communications department for staging this and putting this together. <clears throat> thank you, Michael. Thank you, Janine, very much for having me again. Um, I have a soft spot in my heart for the Brennan Center, not only because of the important and um, impressive work it does, but because uh, my second book, Who, Who Speaks for America, got no attention anywhere except for a lovely event. <laughs> <laughs> Still hasn't sold its printing, I think, of 2,500. <laughs> but it's not available. Someday it'll be very valuable. <laughs> it'll be like the Beatles, which will block the cover. <laughs> dating we'll explain dating ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> or the Springsteen version of Warner Run with the script writing. Um, okay, so. Um, <laughs> I could go on. Uh, I don't, I'm going to try not to talk for very long. Uh, I just want to explain. Um, I, I, I kind of want to sketch out. Uh, where my thinking has, how my thinking arrived where it is, and uh, some of the larger points without going too much into detail of what I, of the things I'm trying to figure out and then uh, leave most of the time for a discussion. Um, so, uh, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm just about finished up now with a project I've been working on um, for about a decade, uh, which is a, uh, is a two book project on uh, the history of post war American liberalism. And um, just today I was writing about arguments over the Iraq War, so I'm almost done. Uh, and, and right now that, that book is like 900 pages long. Jeez. It'll be published next year uh, at something I hope will be 900 pages, but my guess it'll be more like 550 pages. So I'll say things today that no one will from over here. Um, while I was doing that project, uh, uh, I wrote this, as Michael mentioned, I wrote this uh, long essay in the nation, uh, Kabuki Democracy, uh, which I'll spend most of my time uh, talking about. But I also want to bring in um, 
partially actually needs suggestions, but partially because it's, it's what I've been thinking about most freshly, perhaps. Is, um, I've written a series of columns lately, and uh, I've been thinking about doing a, a slightly larger project on, on what I call the conservative class war, which, I mean, a lot of people would call it the conservative class war, but the way I think about it is that um, we're, uh, we're either in the fourth or fifth phase of it, and uh, people, d people, I mean, we live in an incredibly <coughs> ahistorical society and also one that has a very short attention span, so it makes a lot of sense to think of it to look back on it and see how it began and how it developed uh, to make sense of how to uh, make sense of it and also to deal with it. So um, I'll, I'll spend about, I'll try and do Kabuki Democracy in about 10 minutes and then five minutes and show it five more. And uh, if you have any questions about the role of American liberalism, uh, I happen to have in my head a lot about it. Um, although not, not too many great ideas about it. So um, quickly, um, I wrote Kabuki Democracy for two reasons. One was, um, and part of this was just the fact that I was very deeply charmed on a personal level as so many pundits have been in the past by so many potential presidents, but I really couldn't imagine anybody <coughs> who I thought more highly of becoming president than Barack Obama. I've never been more enthusiastic about a candidate Um, and uh, and uh, as I don't need to tell you, um, Barack Obama was elected with super majorities in both houses of Congress, which made the 2008 election much more like a parliamentary election than we usually have, um, in the sense that you could actually hold the president and his party responsible for what they accomplished in a way you can't when you have a uh, divided government. Um, and yet it turned out that um, I expected to be disappointed um, by Obama. I told a friend of mine who was writing a biography of him that I, I thought I was giving him probably 20% too much credit. And 10% of that was you just get excited during election time. And 10% of that was, you know, he, I probably gave him credit for a lot of things he didn't say to me when he was trying to me that I just assumed, you know, the way everyone left Franklin Roosevelt to serve that they thought the opposite thing. Um, and yet, 20% is an awfully high percentage if you look at the first two years of, of what Obama accomplished. I mean, awful low, high or low? Low, low. Yeah, um, come on down. Um, uh, in the book, I examine three primary issues, um, health care, cap and trade, and financial regulation. And I would say the percentage of what Obama was able to accomplish in terms of what he promised and what we had a right to expect based on the fact that uh, the country gave Dem Democrats supermajorities in both houses, I'd say it was probably closer to 30 to 40 percent, which is a significantly smaller percentage of what, uh, say, Ronald Reagan or George uh, w. Bush was able to were able to accomplish in terms of their promises to their constituencies, and again, they were elected uh, with significantly less uh, ostensible power in both houses. So I said to myself, well, there's leaving aside who Barack Obama really is and what he feels in his heart, which none of us can know. I said to myself, well, there's something wrong with this system where it can only deliver on certain kinds of promises, namely conservative style promises, and it can't really deliver on progressive promises. And I wanted to look at why. And the second reason I wrote it is because um, uh, I read the newspapers and the magazines and the websites and so forth. I don't watch television news, but I do watch The Daily Show and Stephen Colbert every morning. <laughs> I can't stay up late and not too old. <laughs> Their DVRs have been invented for people like me. And I don't have to go to work usually, so I watch them. <laughs> um, and, and as much as I appreciate them, and, and would hate to think of what life would be at, like without them. Um, uh, not only do I share the criticism with people that, you know, that rally was so and both sides are not the same. Uh, leaving that aside, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain degree of, um, it's one thing after another every single night. Uh, 
uh, their programs, and, and I say this because I think that their programs just mirror all the other abuse programs and all the other discussions here. Pretty much the front page of the New York Times um, and the Washington Post, although I wouldn't mention those two newspapers in the same subject. Um, which is that every day there's some new crisis, um, there's some new big problem, and then the next day that big problem has gone away, and we have some other big problem, and then that goes away, and um, and yet they don't go away. They just they just recede from attention, uh, and and they're building. And in fact, if you just spent eight years living through the most incompetent, ideologically obsessed, and in certain respects corrupt presidency in this country's history, or certainly in the 20th century, then you're going to have an almost count, an uncountable number of these kinds of problems that have been allowed to fester. Uh, the one I focus on is the uh, is the regulation of o offshore oil drilling because of the spill, <coughs> of course. But if you look at what was going on in the MMS, uh, uh, it, something like a Gulf oil spill was entirely predictable, just like in the case of Katrina, uh, in a, uh, should you have a natural disaster in a place like Norway, something like that was entirely predictable. If you look at the occupation of Iraq, um, the incompetence that was shown uh, by the Bush administration and by the military was entirely predictable because we have allowed our, our regulatory institutions to atrophy and we've allowed industry to basically do what they want and do whatever is profitable. And there's the, 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 the notion of um, regulatory capture is an old one. But if you combine it with the degree of, um, with, with other problems that we face in terms of inability, the, the ease with which it, um, small minorities can bottle up legislation in the Senate and the power of money in, in our election system, then you're just really asking for disasters wherever you expect uh, the government to, to protect you from whatever externality is unprofitable for whatever business to control. So I happen to notice a report <coughs> by the um, American Society of Civil engineers, you know, so it's a kind of impressive thing. Uh, and they gave a they gave a grade to all the various infrastructural, you know, um, uh, all, all the various pieces of infrastructure that are supposed to be regulated by the government. And actually, the oil drilling uh, <coughs> business didn't come off too badly. They, um, the average grade was a C minor, and I think the oil drilling business got a C plus. And they were regulated, by the way, by a, an organization where the people working in it were dealing crystal meth. <laughs> it's not a joke. There was a crystal meth sex scandal in the MMS, which, by the way, is the only time the MMS was ever mentioned in the media before the crisis. There's not a single publication in America that had a dedicated reporter covering that organization. So you had this special set of problems dealing with the overhang of the the legacy of the Bush administration, uh, which they keep popping up <coughs> as if they're Obama's fault, as if they just showed up one day. And, and when they pop up, you know, the whole government has to stop and deal with it. They can't deal with the things that, um, that Obama was elected to allegedly address. So uh, I wanted to look at the entire sort of system <coughs> holistically and see given that I still believe that Obama is just about as well as we can do with the president from the standpoint of progressive politics and intelligence and understanding how the system works, um, to see what, where in this, what in the system was preventing this perfectly excellent guy from making good on these promises that I, in all my cynicism, had come to believe were going to take place. And um, again, uh, there's the Bush legacy problem. There's the problem, which I certainly don't need to tell most of these people in this room about, with regard to the uh, antiquated uh, nature of the Senate and its rules. Uh, and the fact that uh, this is just sort of an accident of history, but the most underpopulated <coughs> places in the country are the most conservative places in the country. And so 29% uh, of the country can easily bottle up the uh, majority desire of um, the other 61%, 71%, yeah, 71%, on 
by having 30, by being represented by 39 senators. Um, a, a legacy of the fact that in Wyoming, <coughs> your vote in the Senate is worth 12 times what it is in California. And uh, the Senate rules are, are written in such a way that um, either through the sort of gesture in the direction of a filibuster, <laughs> you just mentioned, oh, I'm thinking about filibuster or something, and it, and it works like a filibuster, or the um, secret holds, which uh, can be broken, but can also be passed around indefinitely without anyone identifying um, who's doing it. Uh, and, and in order to break them, a few of them were broken at the end of the last session, but you have to stop everything and do nothing but break that secret hold. And again, there's a lot to be done, so they're pretty effective. And so this tiny minority, um, if they're willing, and in this case the Republicans were willing, they can obstruct the, the views, uh, the, the desires of, of an enormous majority of the country. And that happened over and over uh, with the Republicans because they understood from a political standpoint that all of their power derived from remaining united because they were so, they could have been so easily outnumbered. So a lot of them did something Democrats never do, which is they voted against their own specific state interests or their own specific beliefs because they figured they would be repaid later and that this was the way they could manifest their power. So uh, those are the two preliminary problems. The two bigger problems, the one I spend most of my time, most of my time focusing on, are the power of money and the transformation of the media. And again, in this room, I don't need to focus very much on power of money, particularly both Citizen United power of money. That's a given. But I don't think we really, even people who work on the issue all day, uh, take the time to sit back and realize how powerful it is. It's, it's, um, it's, not just, it's not just winning elections. It's not just buying votes. It's creating a whole zeitgeist. It's creating the world we live in. So that, um, uh, you know, if uh, it's, um, it was an insight of, um, I guess, Gramsci originally, but I, I read it most recently in that book by Simon Kwok and, uh, and, I mean, James Kwok and Simon Johnson, that when something becomes self-evident, you don't need to argue about it anymore. And there's so much that's been self-evident since the Clinton administration. If you look at the speeches of Alan Greenspan in that period, about the workings of the market and its, its beauty and its near perfection, that was just pure ideology. It had no relationship to reality. Uh, and yet it was enormously profitable for um, certain who invested in it and have been investing in it for the past 40 years. So, um, so when it came time, uh, so, so in, in, in the first place, um, you have a culture operating on Capitol Hill where the, uh, it seems to me that the people who work on the House Banking, um, the, Senate, the, the House Banking Committee and the Senate Finance Committee view themselves very much the way that, uh, that uh, graduates of law school you uh, clerking for uh, a judge, which is you're getting a couple of years' experience for which you'll be compensated when you go into private practice. And, but when you think about it, there's a built-in conflict of interest in that because they're going to be hired by the very people who, are, uh, who they're supposed to be regulating. So you had a particularly egregious example of it during the financial regulation uh, negotiations where the chief of the of Barney Frank's chief of the uh, House Banking Committee went to work for Goldman Sachs during the negotiation. And then one day he was on one side of the table, the next day he was on the other side of the table, drawing what one assumes is probably 10 to 20 times the salary he was drawing in the first place. And I think Barney did get a little angry about that, because he kind of looked at But by and large, nobody, nobody thinks there's anything in slides that's a bit odd about the fact that everybody goes from one to the other. They go back and forth. Um, and it's just the way things are done. And to be fair to these guys, um, it's very hard to maintain the level of idealism that brings you into these jobs when you're a young person, when you see your friends making five, ten, twenty times what you make, and nothing really gets done, and they have all the fun. And in fact, they also they have the time to learn the actual details of the, of the legislation that you don't, so you become dependent on them. And uh, so on a personal level, it's entirely understandable, but at a systemic level, it's just, it's just, it's a recipe for sustained corruption, which is what we have. And again, uh, even if you had a perfect media, if, if uh, or even if you had a, uh, a much, much better media than we have 
it would still be unable to track this kind of thing because it's, it has to do with things that don't get said, people that don't show up. And, and it's very boring and arcane. And, and there's nobody there in the room anymore. It, there was, during the coverage of the financial regulation legislation, <coughs> at the very end of it, there was, you sort of got a play by play <coughs> of you know, what was dropped and what was kept. And the bill ended up looking a lot tougher than it, uh, people expected because of um, the indictment of Goldman Sachs at the time. Um, but uh, after the bill was passed, <coughs> and, uh, and again, the fundamental problem, it's kind of like, you know, after 9-11, there was, a, there was a legislation introduced to prevent certain nationalities uh, from coming into this country without stricter regulation. And one of the countries left off of that list was Saudi Arabia from which all of the hijackers, except one, came. And, and the same thing went in many respects for the financial regulation, which is that the, the banks that were too big to fail, that ended up costing us so much money that we had to bail out, are now 20% larger than they were when they were too big to fail the first time. Which, and as long as they know that they're too big to fail, we have the same fundamental problem, which is that they're playing with the house's money. Because they win, they win, and we, we have to bail them out if they lose. So, um, some of this got covered, and again, there were some victories, mostly defeat. But the fact is, is that after the legislation is, is passed, you need to write um, dozens and dozens of rules for each paragraph of the, of the legislation. And nobody covers that. And nobody's in the room but the staff and the lobbyists. And the staff and the lobbyists are the same people. There's about fewer than 10% of these people have worked in um, public interest organizations. Uh, and 90% of them have either worked in banks or will work with the Over 50% of them, oh, this is the non uh, secretary of the So the power of money in determining the culture in which our legislation is written is, is really something to behold when you <coughs> step back and look at all the different ways it operates. And, um, and you know, people ask me, what do we do? Uh, what do we do about our problem? Well, every organization has a media component, um, and they have a communication staff, and they, the first thing they think about whenever they do anything substantive is how we're going to get our message heard in the media. But it seems to me every organization uh, that works on anything has to have a money component. How are we going to deal with the people who are invested in this, who have a, who have a financial interest in preventing this from happening, or have a financial interest in making sure that the trade-offs are never really considered? because uh, it was a big problem before Citizens United. It's an enormous problem, in my view, that, that the Supreme Court, it, it's the single most important problem, that the Supreme Court thinks that corporations are people and that money is speech. Um, but uh, that's, not the, that's not the beginning of the end of the problem, and there's an awful lot that needs to be done in that context, assuming that that remains the way the Supreme Court rules for a long time. And, and it, I think it just doesn't make sense to address your problem whether you're an environmental group or a prisoner's <coughs> rights group or health care uh, delivery group without addressing the fact that there's that money is going to talk very loudly in, in that debate. Uh, the final uh, problem that you would have if you were president and you wanted to pass uh, a series of progressive, uh, uh, make good on a series of progressive promises that you would make as a candidate would be the inability of people to hear what you have to say through the current media structure. Um, the media is trans, the media are, sorry, I, I make a big deal out of this and I always forget it myself. So the <laughs> media is a plural, media is a plural noun and so it's the media are and that's important because anything you say about the media is going to be true about some small portion of the media. But broadly speaking, the, the, the elite um, serious media are contracting at, at a degree that no one could have predicted five or six years ago. So that um, the Washington Post and the LA Times are now about 40% uh, smaller in terms of the resources they have to reporting. The Wall Street Journal edition of being smaller was taken over by Murdoch. The New York Times, which is holding the line probably better than any media organization, is about 25% smaller than it was five or six years ago. But when you think about it, they're much smaller than that because the very same staff that um, was doing, that is much smaller, is now being called upon to do all kinds of things they didn't have to do in the past, like blogging and 
making video montages and <laughs> chatting with people and answering their email. And, um, and there's really, if you, uh, I don't know if you saw this, but on Columbia Journalism Review, there was a cover story about the current state of being a reporter, and it had a journal on it, on a wheel, <laughs> uh, which captures it. So there's, uh, there's, a, there's maximum, there's 50% amount of, of uh, actual journalism going on um, that are catching bad guys and keeping, you know, playing the watchdog function. Uh, <coughs> informing, on the one hand, informing the public in a democratic way, and on the other hand, keeping bad stuff from happening because of the, sun, the sunlight. So we've lost about 50% of that, and it's still full. At the same time, uh, the media discourse has been polluted by the success, the enormous success of the now half-century investment that conservatives have made in transforming <coughs> the way we think of it. So I don't mind at all having conservative uh, media outlets. I think that's great. Um, I shared Lionel Trilling's concern in 1950 that liberalism would grow flaccid and weak without a strong conservative intellectual counterpart. But we have something new in, in both in Fox and in talk radio, uh, and in the waves that they create in the rest of the media, which is a, they're not really news organizations. They're political organizations who have no particular um, loyalty to truth. They, they, are, they feel free to lie. Uh, you know, Fox News, no one, no sane person would think it was a coincidence that when Fox News wanted to show footage from a Wisconsin demonstration, that they accidentally showed footage from a California demonstration, which was which which where the protesters were much nastier to the cops than the nice people in Wisconsin. And you know, if you pulled back, you could see the palm trees in Wisconsin in the winter. <laughs> um, at the same time, it's not a coincidence when Fox showed a anti-healthcare rally that at which Fox News person Glenn Beck was speaking. They accidentally showed footage of a much, much larger rally that had happened for something else entirely, but a lot more people went to. And that's a, it's a nice example um, because it's so clean, but it, it happens all the time in all kinds of ways. There's just no, uh, there, there's no shame about it. There's almost no, um, they don't even bother issuing denials anymore when they uh, deliberately disinform their um, audience. And their audience, frankly, doesn't seem to care. They're perfectly happy to be. Uh, misinformed. Uh, people don't realize how powerful this is. It's powerful in two enormous ways. First off, 40 million people in America say they get their news from talk radio. That's twice the number that get it from the CBS, NBC, and ABC Evening News combined. And <coughs> that number's falling. And the other part. So more people get their news from Rush Limbaugh alone has more listeners than any one of those. But second, there's an enormous uh, ripple effect throughout the rest of the media, from Fox News, from other Murdoch-like properties, because they're seen as successful. Their, their audience is engaged, and they make money. And as I said, the rep, everybody else's um, business model is collapsing. The figure, and this is, this is kind of a silly thing, but I think it's very telling, and I, I always repeat it because it drives me so crazy. The single most frequently booked guest on NBC's Meet the Press, the most uh, prestigious uh, news program there is, in 2009 was former speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. He was on nine times. Now, the actual speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, was not on at all. And in fact, if you add up all the former speakers of the Houses, not including Newt Gingrich, who have ever been invited on Meet the Press in the show's history, you get the same number, which is Newt Gingrich. In other words, no other speaker of the House, ex-speaker of the House, has ever been on Meet the Press. The actual speaker on the press was not on. And Newt Gingrich was on nine times. And he says the craziest things. <laughs> I mean, we could spend half the day on that. Um, you know, he thinks Obama's like ruling on the basis of Zulu, you know, voodoo stuff. And, and that he's, I mean, you know, that, that crazy um, Dinesh D'Souza essay, which Gingrich endorsed on the spread. And, uh, and also that Obama seeks to bring a secular socialist state, those are his exact words, uh, onto America, in addition to the Islamic Shi'ara law that he wants to bring in, and also to bring in uh, 
Reverend Wright's Christian <laughs> revolutionary term. Um, but if you think about it, if you put your, yourself in Obama's shoes and you have, you're trying to face up to these very complex trade-offs that are involved in a cap and trade style bill or a health care bill, it's damn near impossible to communicate with the country when you get when you have to face accusations not just that you're a Muslim, but that you're having death panels or that your legislation will put people in jail for having their thermostats. These are actual conversations that are taken seriously in our media that if you want to get public support for, you have to speak to. And, and, and the issues themselves are actually quite genuinely complicated. So, um, and the trade-offs are real. Some people do win, some people do lose. And so to try and uh, communicate through this miasma of these four factors and actually pass your legislation well, I don't really blame Obama. I mean, I do blame Obama for a few things. But this is the fact that the failure of his legislation is not one of them. Um, it, I don't see how it can be done, given the way our system is structured. I think there's so many bottlenecks in the system deriving from these four factors that, uh, that the system has to be transformed before those kinds of promises can be made good on. Uh, do I have five minutes to talk about? Sure. Okay. Um, <coughs> Just to, just to layer, just to layer, uh, to uh, add an additional layer to this analysis, I've been thinking about again what I what I'm calling what what I mean by conservative class war, and what I mean is uh, is a four stage process that we're living in the fourth, possibly entering the fifth <coughs> stage of today. The first stage began. You can date it if you want in 1971 when Lewis Powell, who became a Supreme Court justice, worked, and I'm told was not a bad Supreme Court justice. Um, but he was a, a crazy right winger before that. And he wrote this memo to uh, the Chamber, U.S. Chamber of Commerce where he said that the culture of our country had been taken over by ex student radicals and liberals who had caved into the radicals. And what was needed, he didn't say we need to defeat the radicals, he said we needed to destroy the establishment, the sort of Clark Clifford, Paul Wernicke types, um, and the Ford Foundation, and, and the universities and the networks, and replace them with our own people because the establishment had gone over to the other side and was in the hands of the radicals. And so he concocted this uh, plan, which was, uh, the plan itself was not embraced, but it, it represented the thinking of a large number of very wealthy and very influential people, Robert Bartley of the Wall Street Journal, editorial page, Irving Kristol, who oversaw the giving of the Olin Foundation, Bradley Foundation, Hunt Brothers, the Coors Brothers, and enormous investments were made to create a counter-establishment <coughs> to counteract what they saw as the, uh, the corrupt, uh, America-hating, business-hating liberal stuff. And again, it had two effects, which you can see in the media today. One is that there did create a counter-establishment. Number two, it had a gravitational pull on the liberal stuff, so that the liberal establishment became much more conservative to the degree that it can be said to still exist. Uh, so that was phase one. Phase two was the uh, um, assault on the tax code, which uh, uh, is uh, detailed um, in the recent book by um, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson, which demonstrated that the enormous transformation of our society in terms of wealth, whereby the top 1% of the country which owned uh, Eight percent of its uh, <coughs> assets in the 1960s, but now owns 20 percent of its assets. Was a was not a was, it's not the fault of the global economy. I mean, it's not irrelevant to the way the global economy works. But uh, there was a specific and purposeful action on the part of rich people who were able to use their power in Congress through this cor through corporations and donations, etc., to to change the way our tax structure works so that. Uh, they would be taxed at a much, much lower level. So there was a report in, in uh, Bloomberg recently that the 400 richest people in America pay an average tax rate of 16%, uh, which is a lot lower, I imagine, than anybody else in this room, unless you're one of the <laughs> Or you're really, really in trouble. <laughs> um, interns, interns don't count. They're not. They're not. Um, <laughs> So that was phase two. Um, phase three is the transformation of the media, 
which I've just discussed. <coughs> so I won't go into more detail about that. But we do have a transform media industry today. And the creation of all these media institutions. By the way, the media institutions are self-sustaining because they're profitable. Now, after they've, I mean, trillion, billions of dollars have been invested and lost forever. But now, a lot of them are profitable. They run it there like perpetual motion. Phase four is what we're seeing in Wisconsin and Michigan and Ohio, where all of the, it's not just the legislation of the Great Society of the New Deal, but all of the gains of the welfare state are now under siege and um, being attacked uh, using the excuse of the financial crisis, which of course has very little to do with the, the alleged causes being given for the attacks. I mean, public unions are not the reason in any of places for the shape that the states are in. Um, it's not that they don't contribute at all, but their, their contribution is minor. And if you, if you look at uh, the studies of things, you can find far more significant causes. And, and as with Governor Walker, and also the same thing was true of Mr. Ryan's big budget, which is slightly different case, but nevertheless, there's always more tax breaks for the rich stuck into these crisis bills that I'm so worried about having. So that's phase four, and we're seeing it everywhere. Um, it's about New Jersey, Ohio, etc. And then phase five, I don't know exactly what phase five is going to be, but I think it has something to do with the uh, attempt to shut down Mr. Cronin, Professor Cronin, and the University of Wisconsin, and the uh, labor uh, research organization at the University of Michigan. Um, there's another case like this, whereby with, with any, anyone who accepts public funds for anything, grant money, whatever, will be barred from speaking on the issue in question. The same way during the Bush administration, if you, if you had any expertise on global warming, you weren't allowed to speak. You know? um, and, and, and this, uh, the, 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 again, uh, when you saw a phrase, again, this was on Meet the Press, where Rick Santelli, uh, could compare the financial crisis in the states to 9-11. He said we're facing a, a, uh, a fiscal 9-11 and so emergency measures are necessary. You can see that just how far this, uh, <coughs> this attack is willing to go. So um, I think I'll stop there. And I've said more than enough. So see if anyone has any solutions to the problem besides not inviting me to lunch. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I think you're pointing to a problem which has been a problem for liberalism for the past 30 or 40 years. It's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't view it in the terms, in the same terms as the problems I'm discussing. There's definitely been, a, a big part of the early stage of the conservative class war was to invest in, ac in academic or quasi-academic because they weren't getting the kinds of answers they wanted from respectable, genuine academics. So they created, you know, you get these fancy sounding chairs at think tanks that make it seem like you know what you're doing when there's no reason to believe you actually do. <laughs> and, and it just so happens that your views happen to match the views of the funders of the think tank every single time. Um, liberals, uh, th there was actually, I mean, a lot of what conservatives say about academia is true. Um, what they say about the media is actually true of academia. I, I, I'm a kind of a conservative one. Um, it, is a, it is a very left-wing culture in academia, and that's because a lot of the people who saw themselves as radicals in the 60s did decide to go into academia because it was kind of an alternative culture. They didn't have to put on suits and become lawyers and, and make the kinds of, they could put off the kinds of compromises 
and they're now the elders, and they and they like to keep uh, like to believe they kept true to their values. Um, and what they've done is is taken themselves out of the public discourse. And so there are very few people like Arthur <coughs> Schlesinger or Richard Hofstadter or Lionel Trilling anymore whose voices are heard beyond the academy. Many of these people speak a language that nobody else understands, and they deal with problems that aren't real problems. They're problems of language or they're problems of academic governance. I mean, they're, they may or may not be real problems, but they don't have a kind of, of systemic worldview that others have had in the past, and it's really robbed liberalism of one of its most valuable resources. Um, the debates, uh, you know, th things like the Charles Murray debate we had a few years ago, or the debate over, um, over uh, <coughs> uh, um, uh, supply side economics. There's very little heard from people who have the expertise to deal with these because they have lost the ability to speak to the larger public. Um, the idea of, but, but today, uh, you would think that journalists, and, and in fact, I, I sometimes am on hiring committees, mm -hmm. and it's a shame the resumes we get at Brooklyn College from people who have, look like they have great jobs, but are, expect to lose them or are terrified that they don't have much time. But in fact, uh, academia is in at least as much trouble from a financial standpoint as journalism. And, and I used to, People, young people would come to me and say, what do I do? You know, I want to be a journalist, but it's such a terrible thing. And I used to advise them, well, why don't you hang out in graduate school for a few years? They'll pay for you. You'll learn something useful. And then when you come out, you'll have an expertise. <coughs> but now the, the whole world of academia is so unpromising in terms of it's shrinking just as much as journalism. That, that again, this is another example where the world is really unfair from the standpoint of right versus left. Because the right has invested in all of these various institutions, so that you never really need to publish a decent work of scholarship to have a very nice career <coughs> in going through AEI, Hoover, Cato, um, Heritage, etc. You can stay in one of these places your whole life. There's, there's, there's people, um, I, I read a review, there's, I won't say his name in part because I'm getting old and I can't remember it, <laughs> but there's, there's, there's a guy, that, one, the, the top foreign policy person at AEI, <coughs> one of the top foreign policy people, I happened, when I was doing some research, to come across his thesis, uh, his, his doctoral thesis. And it was so bad, I couldn't believe it. Like, this guy should not have been given past his orals. And yet, he has been able to uh, uh, amass all of these honors all throughout, because they have created this structure that is self-reinforcing. And journalists can't really tell the difference between good research and bad research. So it has an insidious effect on, on our public discourse. And it also has a magnetic effect on young people. Eric? I want to tie in one of the things you first said and then something you said about the media before you went to your last five minute segment. And asked, and that is you started by saying as a contextual point that we are in an ahistorical society. Mm -hmm. And you ended your penultimate discussion about media by talking about how facts don't become important, et cetera. So I was thinking of this um, novel, since you teach literature, by Wallace Stegner, who was also an academic, uh, called Angle of Repose, for which he yeah, won the Pulitzer Prize. And you might remember in the beginning of that book, before he gets into the story of his family, he says, my son Rodman is an existential man. He believes that history began with him. And then he says about himself, you know, I believe in history. I believe that I come from, I forget, the ashes or the tents of my family, something like that. And then I was thinking, that led me to your last part, because I was thinking when Obama gave his last State of the Union message, as I was watching it, what I was thinking about was probably 75% of Americans, something like 40 million households were watching that, or even more, I forget what the United States was, didn't know what a uh, Sputnik moment was. Probably 70% of Americans didn't know what the jobs of his audience were, the Congress of the United States, what, what each of their roles were, what the court was in there, what these various administrative agencies do. 
So I think you leave out of this analysis, particularly when you then get to the last point about the media, I think you leave out of this, and I know that I'm, this is a horse I'm riding right now, so please. But um, I think you really leave out how we have given up educating people in, about their government, about their history. So in 19, the end of the 1940s, I think the figure was fully 70% of Americans in public education were getting current event courses, civics courses, government courses, and history courses throughout it. And right now, that's down. The latest figure I saw, they might get one course in, they might have one course in their entire career. So when they keep hearing things, you know, they become existential men or women because of the fact that education is failing them. You know, these, this knowledge isn't genetic. This knowledge has got to be educated. And so it's interesting when I then hear Obama push for, uh, you know, race to the top, and then as a result I see New York State canceling its region, its assessments in social studies because they say they don't have enough money anymore. So now they're not going to test, and you were pointing out yourself about testing society. So no testing, no teaching. It seems to me that a really critical problem is we're falling off the map in terms of the levels of information that young people and older people now, since it's generations old, this problem, know about this government. And it's easy, easy to convince people <coughs> of things because they have no context, no history, no experience and we don't bother anymore. So I think this is another level of an issue that you really would, you know, think about. I'd like to hear you respond to it. Thank you. Uh, a specific response and then um, one of the points. Specifically, of course I agree with you, um, but I, I think uh, I would look at this as another triumph of the rights investment in terms of downgrading the, the honor of government, the importance of government. Um, Ronald Reagan is one of Ronald Reagan's advisors. I remember I was in college when I heard this, said, we like people who mind their own business, who who who, aren't, who don't who don't pay too much attention to government, who just go on and do their jobs. We don't really think citizens should be. There's something wrong with people who pay too much attention to to politics, and I think that the con consistently <coughs> downgrading the the value of government and the constant attacks without any uh, attention to the specifics of what government has done for people over the years has made it possible for. This, this particular form of education atrophy. And, and, and now we're getting the second phase of that, which is the attack on teachers, which is a, a similar phenomenon. But, you know, as I heard a statistic recently, which I, I'm told is true, which is very important, which is, um, and this is not specifically about the problem of education, which is you're always reading about how American students perform horribly uh, compared to their counterparts in, in standardized testing. But if you drop out the lowest 20% income-wise, we do just great. So, so there's, what it really is is a class problem that we're incapable of discussing. That we that we don't know how to educate our poor students because when you think about it, if if you're if you're really really poor and you're hungry and there's no you know you don't you're living a life of all kinds of insecurity, it's very hard to focus on school. It's very hard to you know particularly in, in you know, when my daughter goes to public school, she gets four hours of homework a night. You know, you can't do four hours of homework a night, uh, except in circumstances where you have a home that, you know, allows for it. And if you don't have that, then, then you're, you're lost from the start. So I think that there's a, um, there's, there's, a, there's a problem in our ability to uh, face up to the class aspects of our problem that is embedded in our discussions of education. And, and again, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a victory for the right. Uh, I, I think it's uh, Ed Doctorow said that if you read a novel and it's about a working class person, the novel is considered a political novel. Um, you know, there was something, the, the, main governor, the main governor felt there was something subversive about having a mural of working people. Like there's something wrong with work. In the labor. Yeah, the labor movement. <laughs> Good point. So, so again, this is the, the, the right has been so energetic and and so uh, their 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 investment has been so disciplined and so patient and so powerful that they've won all kinds of battles that, that you know 
we're only vaguely aware of. But um, these chickens are coming home to eat. These permits. Dr. Um, I wanted to congratulate you for being the first person I've ever heard pronounce Black Sid properly in public. That was very impressive. Let's not go too deeply into it. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> unbelievable. Um, so, uh, what I wanted to ask you when I look at the when I look at the subtitle of your book, "The System versus Barack Obama," is a question that I, I think a lot of us struggle with um, trying to piece together. You could almost put in parentheses "money driven" in front of "system." You know, the money driven system versus Barack Obama. Is he, in your mind, after doing this work, is he? A facilitator of that system? Is he outside of that system? Is he uh, resisting that system? Where? What is his relationship to it for you? Um, yeah, well, uh, there's some people who, particularly on the left, who think Barack Obama is entirely to blame for his own failures, and, and um, they really hate him. Uh, I have a personal view, um, which, you know, it's just nothing more than my opinion, which is that Barack Obama has succeeded in life by becoming kind of a chameleon. That he's, he's, he's grown up in all of these radically disparate situations, and he has a genius for adapting to them. And what we're seeing in Barack Obama is the system itself. So that he has good, um, he has good instincts, he's a good guy, he's a liberal, you know, uh, if there isn't too much resistance to being a liberal, in much the same way as Bill Clinton was. Um, but uh, Clinton, Clinton had a need to please everyone and to make sure everyone was happy. I don't think Barack Obama feels that way. I think Barack Obama sees himself as a, as a kind of poker player who, who's playing the hand that he's dealt. There's a quote in the, um, in the book that I borrow from uh, an interview David Remnick did for his book about Obama um, from one of Obama's mentors in, in Chicago. Uh, I forget the guy's name, 